Today I'm going to be talking about um, how chess helps children in the 21st century. Um, and then this afternoon, later, I'm going to be talking about psychological preparation for children playing in chess tournaments. So I'm going to gloss over that part of it in this talk. But I'd like to first just begin with uh, what chess is. It's obviously a game. Um, not so obviously, it's a sport. Uh, several years ago at the New York Athletic Club, they made me an athletic member. And so I'm sitting down at our inaugural luncheon with all of these other people who are athletic members. So who's at my table? A gold medalist in wrestling, a gold medalist in swimming, a gold medalist in fencing, and several other people who were just absolutely extraordinary. When it came my turn to talk, I said that I was with chess, and they all said, that's not a sport. <laughs> Well, a lot of other countries disagree, but it's an interesting thing that although chess is not considered to be an athletic activity, the brain is only 2 or 3% of the human body, but it uses 25% of the oxygen that you breathe. It is the most energy-intensive part of the body. So from that point of view, chess is more of a sport than a whole lot of other ones. Um, but in addition to that, it's also a science. There's a lot of real science in this game. Science is all about experimentation, come up with a theory of something, test it out, see if it works, let other people verify it. When you get to the ending, the king and pawn ending, for example, if you know the square of the pawn, opposition, outflanking, and key squares, you can look at any one of 10,000 positions and within a few seconds know what the result should be. That's science. Uh, chess is also an art because creativity is rewarded, and the results are both beautiful and significant. So that makes it an art as well. And it's been around for quite some time. In its current form, it's about 500 years old. And it existed in other forms for about 1,000 years before that. Um, so what does this ancient game have to do with our 21st century, where things are just flying at a very fast-paced digital age? This young lady was once asked, what do you want to be when you graduate from college in five years? And her answer was terrific. It's based on the idea that today there are a huge number of jobs that did not exist five years ago. And there's a huge number of jobs that did exist five or ten years ago that do not exist now. They've just been superseded. Her answer was, oops, I don't know. The job I want hasn't been invented yet. So, what we have to do as teachers, oh, by the way, how many people here are, are teachers? Let's see a show of hands. Fabulous, wonderful, okay. What we have to do as teachers is prepare children to jump into an age where we don't even know what the jobs are going to be. We may not know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. It's going to be the children. And it's our job as the adults in the room to guide them up that road of life. And the better we do that, the more successful they and our world is going to be. It's really all about the child. And a child is simply a small human being training to be an adult. <laughs> and childhood is a time to try out everything and see what works and what doesn't. In fact, that's one of my favorite lines in school. When a child is misbehaving, I say, you know, childhood is a time to try things out, see what works and what doesn't. You know that thing you just did? That doesn't work. <laughs> and then move immediately on to something else. We're not going to debate. <laughs> um, anyway, teachers are people who help guide children towards adulthood. And we're doing that by teaching not just facts, we're teaching a process. We're teaching how to succeed. And unfortunately, if we do it wrong, we're teaching how to fail. So it's very, very important as teachers that we understand what our role is. There's a child psychiatrist named Ned Hollowell who came up with five keys to adult happiness. And the first one is connection. You must feel a connection. You have to feel valued, cherished, and a part of the community that you're in. And the next idea is 
kids have to have free play. Just run around with your friends, make up rules, negotiate strategies, decide what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Just make it all up, have fun. But then at some point, there should be something that enters the child's life that requires practice, something that has a skill set to it. It can be dance, it can be music, it can be ceramics, it can be horseback riding, anything that really requires a skill set. Now, of course, my favorite is obviously chess. <laughs> um, and after they practice it, and by the way, going back to the teacher's role, it is our job not just to teach these things, to help them with their practice, but also imbue with them in them a sense of communication, a, a sense of connection. It's a very important part of teaching that the children really feel connected to you and that you feel connected to them. So once they've been practicing for a while, they will achieve a level of, of mastery. And with that comes recognition, and we're back to a sense of connection again. They're really a part of a community. And the chess community is absolutely amazing for this. The children that I taught in the South Bronx are now in their late 20s and early 30s. Their sense of community amongst themselves, regardless of where they're living right now or what they've been doing, they are all really still connected. Um, it's gorgeous to see. Now, my goal as a teacher is not to turn out masters or grandmasters. It's really, oops, sorry to help the students grow up to be thoughtful, caring, and productive adults. And I have never seen anything as effective for this as chess. There's a lot of other good things out there, music, tremendous number of other good things. But chess requires a whole different set of skills that we'll be talking about in just a moment. And this goes back to that sense of connection as a teacher. They're not going to listen to you unless they know that you care about them. Nobody cares what you know unless they know that you care. We need to model the behavior we want to see in our students. We need to believe in each one. And one thing that they've all got to know is that I will never give up on you. I had a student in the Bronx. Um, this guy, he was not one of my top players by any stretch. We're at the state tournament. We're leading by three full points going into the last round. It's only four points that count. So it looks like we're going to be a, have a cakewalk in the last round. All of my players are playing down, except one. And he's playing a girl 300 points higher than him, and we know her. She's one of our rival teams in the Bronx. She's a tough one. So I give them this big talk about it's very important that you not let up now. And I ask, how many of you have beaten people rated higher than you? They all raised their hands. I said, how many of you have lost to people rated lower than you. They all raised their hands. And I said, so don't take it easy here. This next round is going to be rough. You got to go in there and prove it. And I sent them in. And little Shiraz comes up to me. He's playing Merlina, the tough girl. And he says, how am I going to do, Mr. McAnulty? Well, if I were to tell him what I really thought at the moment, I would have said, well, you know, you're probably going to get clobbered. <laughs> But don't worry about it because Damien and Quad and Jillian and Lisa, they're all going to win, so it will be fine. That's not what I said. What I said was, you know, Shiraz, I've seen you solve a mate in five, and I've seen you hang your queen. Which Shiraz are you going to send in to go play Merlina? And he got this look of steely determination on his face. And then he gave me a big smile, and he said, the one who solves a mate in five. Now, You've probably already guessed that I'm telling this story for the reason that his, his is the only game we won. <laughs> yes. Show them that you believe in them and you will get miracles. And another lesson from this is never count anybody out. Never put a limit on anybody. You don't know what they're capable of doing. And that's only one of about six or seven other stories that I could tell about lower level players who have given us a championship. Um, this one I really like. Your value as a person does not, does not depend on your performance in a chess game. You're valuable regardless of your results. So let's talk about these adults that we're trying to turn children into. A well-prepared adult has knowledge of the field, whatever that field may be, academic and thinking skills appropriate to that field, 
And this is one that a lot of people are missing. Social and emotional intelligence, so they can communicate properly with those hierarchically above, at their level, and below. You must always treat everyone with respect. One of the things that I just love is uh, these pictures of Barack Obama. Um, and he can be talking with the president of another country, or he can be holding his head down for a little boy to push, push his head. Um, he really had that amazing ability to communicate with anybody. That is big time emotional intelligence. Now, let's deal with what we're doing, chess. And how are we going to prepare people for these three areas here? Knowledge of the field. Okay, as a coach, I want to make sure that my children, my students, have great technical preparation for chess. And as that great philosopher Bruce Lee once said, without technique, there can be no art. You have to have technique. And that means you need to know tactics. We need to work on opening principles. And beyond opening principles, they have to have an opening system or a set of opening systems that they really are fully immersed in. They need to know middle game themes, open files, outposts, pawn structures, rooks on the seventh, endings. This is one of my favorites because so many coaches don't do it. <laughs> you really need to work on those endings. And the better you do that, the more games you're going to win. They need to know checkmate patterns. They need to know the five elements, time, space, material, pawn structure, king safety. They need to be able to assess any given position by understanding all of these items, as well as having a concept of strategy. Now, what are the thinking skills that go along with this? Well, obviously pattern recognition, classifying and categorizing information, following a sequence, foreseeing consequences, reasoning by analogy, how is this like that? Can I use this idea over here? Or is there some special nuance to this idea that um, makes it so that it won't work? Calculating. Andy Soltis wrote a wonderful book where he says, if you ask a grandmaster what they're doing in a chess game, if they're going to be honest, they're going to tell you, I'm calculating. And we're comparing and contrasting, we're analyzing, we're following principles. Now, this was interesting. Just the other day, I had a couple of students playing chess, and one of them won a night. He's now up a whole piece, and he's got this fantastic position. And he immediately started trading. I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, you said that when you're ahead, you trade material. And I said, well, that's one of the principles, but let's analyze this position. Take a good look. What else is going on here? Maybe that's not the principle to follow here. And he looked at it a little more, bit more, and he said, oh, <laughs> he had a mate in three. <laughs> so he was following the wrong principle. <laughs> so you have to know what to do when principles conflict. Now, what we've been talking about sounds like nice, clear, cold calculation. I'm thinking. I'm thinking about analogies. I'm thinking about patterns, all of these things. But in fact, you don't do that in an emotional vac va vacuum. Um, emotional intelligence is a big part of your chess playing. Um, I'm going to skip over this part here because I'm going to be doing it later today. And let's talk about what an emotionally intelligent person is like. An emotionally intelligent person has patience, has self-control, can delay gratification, is respectful, sympathetic, empathetic, confident, optimistic, successful, responsible, honest, integrous, and is self-motivating. Now, one of the great things about chess is we can do every single one of those as teachers with chess. Even something that looks somewhat remote from chess. Um, sympathy and empathy. <laughs> Those seem to be fairly remote from chess, don't they? I mean, you're out there trying to clobber the other person. That's it. <laughs> 
But in fact, as a teacher, there are teachable moments all the time. I had a student once who won a game, first game at the national tournament. He came charging out, happy as can be, jumping up and down with excitement. He's just won his first game at the nationals. And he's talking about how his opponent was a total fish, didn't know anything about chess. And I'm trying to calm him down, and I finally get him quiet. And I turn him around, and I point to this little boy behind him who's crying his eyes out in his daddy's arms. And I said, is that the little boy you just played? He kind of went quiet and said, yes. I said, you know, you were very loud. He heard everything you said. The kid was shocked. He walked over and apologized. And I thought that was wonderful. But it also goes to show that we can use chess to teach things that seem to be rather remote from the cold calculation, I'm going to clobber this person across the table from me. I love this quote. <laughs> Thinking is a very messy process. Uh, this was said by Jonathan Rousen, who is not just a grandmaster, and therefore knows quite a bit about thinking. He also has a PhD in philosophy, so he knows even more about thinking. <laughs> and when he says something about thinking, you should pay attention. And his idea is that while you're thinking, you are remembering, you're evaluating, you're judging, you're analyzing, you're comparing, and you're also doubting. There's a little fear that creeps in sometimes. Sometimes you're seeing ghosts, not literally seeing ghosts. <laughs> um, we use that term in chess when someone sees an attack that isn't real, but they avoid something because they think there's this horrible attack coming. Um, or they don't do something because they think their opponent has an easy solution to it, and it turns out they don't. So we say that they're seeing ghosts. And that will definitely color the way you approach the game. Um, in fact, it even happened to Gary Kasparov in his match with Deep Blue. Horrendous moment where he could have gotten a draw, thought that Deep Blue would be able to solve the problem, and ended up resigning when he could have had a draw. Also, while you're doing all of this thinking, sometimes your mind just simply wanders. It goes off somewhere else, and you don't say, hey, come back, I got to think. <laughs> and Frequently, you're misunderstanding things as well, like that boy who misunderstood the principle about exchanging pieces when you're ahead. But ultimately, you must make a decision. And Mr. Rousen again, chess players thinking is drenched with emotion, because while you're doing all of these clever things that we've just been talking about, you're also worrying, because the tournament clock is ticking. There is tremendous pressure. So you got to do all that stuff while worrying, doubting, fearing, and all of these other things that are creeping in to your game. At least they creep into my games. <laughs> um, but the important thing to know when things do go awry, and they will, is that failure is not a definition of who you are. It really is not. We all fail. We all make colossal mistakes. It's not the end when you have a terrible tournament or a terrible game. It just sh shows you what you need to work on. And if you work on it, you'll get there. Now, through chess, we learn that preparation is everything. The better you prepare, the more likely you are to win. I remember in 1990, there was a world championship in New York between Kasparov and Karpov. And they were playing a Zaitsev variation of the Lopez. And they were following a game that had been played before. And all the masters and grandmasters are wondering who's going to deviate first. Well, Gary was the one who deviated first. He came up with this amazing move, F3. And Karpov went into a deep thing for 15 or 20 minutes and came to the wrong conclusion. Um, when it was over, he was being interviewed, and someone said, so are you feeling depressed or upset over this loss? And he looked at the guy like, what planet are you from? Do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> he said, no. That was just his homework. That was his preparation. My team and I will look at it. We'll solve the problems. We'll be fine. 
Preparation. It won that time. It would not win a second time <laughs> because the other guy is going to be preparing. Now, we also learned that everything we do has consequences. And, you know, it's interesting. When I asked my students, what does the word consequence mean? They all come up with something negative. Like, you know, if I don't do this, I won't get that. Um, that's not the only meaning of consequence. Consequence is just what comes after. The consequence of preparation is you'll do well. So preparation is something that I really believe in. My parents were both concert pianists, and I would hear them practice thousands and thousands of hours, and I'm not making that number up, for a two-hour concert. So preparation really works. Everything we do has consequences. We have to take responsibility for our actions, touch move rule, and lots of others. Uh, chess is all about overcoming obstacles. Every game you play is loaded with obstacles. And obviously you're going to be dealing with a lot of pressure when you play. And chess is a great laboratory for learning how to handle pressure. When I do these talks in other countries, sometimes I hear people who have been through scholastic chess and they talk about the pressures that their colleagues feel in the workplace. And they all say, these guys have no idea what they're talking about. They do not know pressure. If you've been in a national tournament with two minutes to make your next 10 moves, that's pressure. <laughs> this stuff here is minor. It's amazing how, how well chess players handle pressure after they've been through this. Um, you also have to be able to be flexible, always ready to respond to changing circumstances. Maybe your opponent's going to make some phenomenal move and you'll have no idea what's going on. You've got to make an adjustment right away. And of course, frequently, as with the case of Karpov, the adjustment won't be correct. But you'll learn from it, and you'll grow, and you'll improve. And, oops, don't want to skip over this one because it is the most important. Be persistent. Do not give up. Do not quit, ever. When you're winning, keep the pressure on. When you're losing, look for ways to, keep com to come back. Oops, oops. Okay, so now let's jump into our 21st century job skills. Now that we've seen what chess does, let's see what's expected of people in the 21st century. There are these things called the four C's, and I've actually added a fifth one. Um, the four C's are, can you guess what this is supposed to represent? Yes. Collaboration, absolutely. Working together. That's something that you're all going to do, and I trust you've all been doing it. Um, collaboration is something that I, <laughs> if it weren't for collaboration, my teams would never do anything, because I'm not good enough to, do what our, to get our teams to where they've gone. Um, I hire people who know more than me. We work together, we collaborate, we talk about things constantly. We're working with the parents, we're working with the children, we're working with each other. It's collaboration that makes for success. And the next is communication. Now, obviously, you can't collaborate if you're not communicating. So this is a little redundant here. Um, but communication, you've got to be able to talk to other people and work together. And that's kind of clever, isn't it? Somebody carved an apple and made a butterfly. In today's world, people are going to be expecting a lot of creativity out of you. Creativity is when you come up with new ideas, new formulations, new constructions. However, the new construction, the new formulation, the new idea might not be good. It might be great. But you don't know that until you have applied critical thinking. And in chess, we're constantly going back and forth between creative, creativity and critical thinking. You creatively come up with a good idea. Then you use the critical thinking to analyze that idea and do all those things that we were talking about earlier. These are the things that are going to be expected of people in the 21st century job skills. And look at this. There isn't one of them up there that chess doesn't do just amazingly well. Chess is the best preparation for entering the modern world that I've ever seen. And by the way, I said that was the fifth one. Cross-cultural understanding. We're constantly working with people from different cultures, different milieus, different ways of looking at things, different approaches to life. 
we have to be able to work with all of them. And so to me, these four plus the respect that we give to absolutely everyone is really critical. Now, in addition to those things, there are nine abilities and skills that are going to be important in helping our children thrive in the ever-changing 21st century global world. And I'm going to run through these fairly quickly because we've actually done all of them. Uh, first is, oops, the ability to recognize patterns, the ability to adjust rapidly and accurately to changing circumstances, the ability to handle pressure, analyzing complex situations and problems. If that isn't chess, I don't know what is. <laughs> uh, the ability to work with others on a team. Um, Bobby Fischer didn't do that. He was the lone wolf. He was the exception to the rule. Um, I don't know that he's possible anymore. Um, this was something, uh, I was a theater major originally, and um, our drama teacher called a bunch of us in together, those of us who were heading towards professional theater, and he said, okay, what's the most important thing you can do as a professional actor? And we all talked about, you know, learn your lines, show up on time, um, research your character, all these kinds of things. And he looked at us all and said, well, of course. We expect that. That's like breathing. That's absolutely necessary. But the most important thing is that you must be easy to work with. And that goes back to the collaboration of the communication. You must be easy to work with. And whoops. Let me back up one more. These are some of the people who helped me with my team. Uh, this first fellow over here is Grandmaster Moran Cher. Um, one of the greatest chess coaches in the world. Uh, one of his students went on to become Magnus Carlsen's coach. Um, beside him is his wife, Ala Grunfeld. She was the 1986 Russian women's champion. I'm not supposed to say the date, sorry. <laughs> um, and then there's a couple of other masters there, and this is women's international master Beatrice Marinello, who was one of the people that I've been working with since I first started being a, a professional chess teacher. These are the people who really are responsible for my success. It's the collaboration with them, the working together with them, the communication with them that has made us so successful. And Steve Jobs, I'm sure you know him. He said one of the keys to Apple is that Apple is an incredibly collaborative company. Collaboration is going to win a lot of things for you. Uh, you might wonder, what is a women's fashion magazine doing here? <laughs> um, several years ago, the publisher for Lucky um, wanted me to teach her staff to play chess. Now, to my knowledge, this has never been done before or since. An entire corporate staff learning to play chess. So when it was all over, um, it was an eight-week sequence, and when it was all over, I said, okay, now, Sandy's idea, she's the publisher, Sandy's idea was that this would somehow help you in the workplace. And I'm really curious, did it? And if it did, please tell me how. Well, one person said that when he came to work prior to chess, he felt that he was a rat doing a maze. He said, I'm, you know, I'm a smart guy, I was doing the maze pretty well, but every time I came to a corner, I had to try to figure out where to go next. He said, now that I've been playing chess, I don't feel as if I'm in the maze, I feel as if I'm looking down on the maze. And I thought that was a fantastic change in perspective. Another person, uh, this woman said that her job is assigning roles in groups for special projects. And that's all publishing is, is a bunch of special projects and they put them all together and bingo, here comes her magazine. She says now that she's played chess with everybody on the staff, she's seen the people who think too much, she's seen the people who are too impulsive, she's seen the people who realize that they must do everything they can within the limited time span that they have and make a decision, and a whole host of other personality types that have come out in the game of chess. She said that she is now much more accurate in assigning roles within a group for a project. And she said the result is that in the last eight weeks we have gotten steadily more efficient because she is able to assign roles much more accurately based on the personality types that come out 
in the game of chess. I thought that was amazing. I would love to do this again somewhere else. <laughs> um, another thing we get from chess is that we must persevere when presented with daunting obstacles. And that's one of the things that's going to be required in the job market today. The ability to persevere, don't give up. Um, I once met a Navy SEAL and I said, you guys, you know, there's like a hundred of you try out and three of you make it. What's the difference between you and those other 97? He said, I wasn't the fastest, I wasn't the smartest, I wasn't the strongest. I was the one who wouldn't quit. And that's one of the things that we're trying to get across in chess all the time, isn't it? Don't quit. Um, poor Gary did, in fact, quit. <laughs> um, you must be able to control your emotions. And chess really gives you ample opportunity for that because when you lose those first few games, it's devastating. And eventually you get so that you recognize, hey, okay, this is a little blip in, this, in, the, in the little path. It's not a big deal. I can overcome this. Um, Kamran Shirazi is an international master. He was playing a match at the um, US Open, uh, New York Open many years ago, when there was a New York Open. And he's playing against a grandmaster, and there's a bunch of us watching because it's a fascinating game. And the grandmaster made a move, and the whole group of us just stepped back, like, wow, where did that come from? And the buzz was, Shirazi's dead. Well, Shirazi didn't seem to know that. He took a drink of water, realized his cup was empty, casually got up, strolled over to the water fountain, filled his cup again, took a sip, refilled it, went back, sat down, took another sip, looked up at the ceiling for a couple of seconds, and then buried his head in his hands for about 15 minutes. And finally, he uncorked a move, and everybody jumped back again. <laughs> and now we thought, oh no, the Grandmaster's dead. <laughs> uh, he had total control over his emotions. He was like an ice cube. Um, and the game was eventually a draw. <laughs> The ability to maintain good impulse control is something that is going to be critical in your life. There was an interesting study done in Australia where they carried an experiment through for 35 years following just about everybody in this very small town. And the very first test that they gave had a component in it for impulse control. And that was the through line all the way up. Those with good impulse control were the ones most likely to hold a job for a long period of time, to get promotions, to have a successful marriage, to have well-adjusted children. Those with poor impulse control at the age of five were the ones most likely to become alcoholics or drug abusers or abusive husbands or wives, um, didn't hold good jobs, and their children were generally a little bit messy. It was all about impulse control. Now, one of the things that I find fascinating is that we can actually use chess to help with impulse control. I have a little game that I like to play called the Maharaja and the Sepoys in the book that I got it from. I have no idea how it got this name. But this is a game that I use with students who just have terrible impulse control and can't hang on to their pieces. You'll notice one side has all their pieces, the other side only has a queen. However, that queen also moves like a knight. That makes her a rather awesome piece. Put her in the center, she controls a block of 25 squares. Put the opposing king on a5, put her on c5, and it's checkmate. <laughs> so, the way you win is by capturing the queen. The way the queen wins is by checkmating the king. Well. If you've got any loose pieces anywhere, that's somebody that's not guarded. If you've got any loose pieces anywhere, that queen is going to grab it up. And in no time at all, your army is decimated. Three or four games of that, and they start getting really systematic, and they start controlling every piece on the board. They don't leave anybody unguarded. And at that point, you have at least temporarily conquered this concept of poor impulse control. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool. 
the ability to formulate a strategic plan to accomplish a goal. Where are we now? Where do we want to go? How are we going to get there? I saw a great sign. Uh, oh, shoot. I saw a great sign at a crafts fair once. It was done with really elaborate design, but I just love this. If you don't know where you're going, it's hard to figure out how to get there. So if you don't have a strategic vision, you don't know where you're going. But the strategic vision is going to be very valued in the job market. And success is simply doing something better than before. If you've just learned, if you know nothing about chess and you have learned how to name the squares on an alphanumeric grid of a chessboard, that's a success. It may not seem like much, but it is a success. And it prepares students for the next level. How do you move a king? One square at a time. Easy. Great. Another success. How do you move a rook? Ranks and files. Another success. How can you attack this king with this rook? By getting on the same rank or the same file. Another success. Little by little, what we're teaching is how to succeed. And optimism comes from having been successful at something before, and you think you can become successful at the next thing. So when we're teaching chess, don't think we're just teaching moves and rules. We're teaching a process for learning. And if we do that successfully, we're going to have an amazing group going into the world, and they're going to have a nice path down that road that we've helped them on. Thank you very much.